Okay, thanks everyone for tuning in. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about how we fund the future of the Australian games industry. And a little bit about myself, I'm the founder and CEO of Mighty Kingdom. Um, we are the largest independent game developer in Australia, although I'm not sure how much longer we can say that. There's a few contenders nipping at our heels, which is a, an exciting place to be. Um, but more relevant to today's discussion, um, Mighty Kingdom has received investment um, over the last couple of years. And we've been on a bit of a journey. It's our, it's our 10th year this year. Um, and we've gone from startup to scale up and, and now looking sort of beyond that. And as always, you know, I like to um, start these talks off before we sort of look forward at the, how we're gonna fund the, the future of our industry. I like to look back a little bit and see where we are and look at what challenges we have in front of us. Now, I'm not gonna go back through the, the GFC uh, history again. I think we've done that um, plenty of times. But uh, what I will say, you know, since the last GCAP, it has been a hell of a year. A lot has happened. The world has practically turned upside down. It seems a long time ago now, but the, the year began with a series of unprecedented bushfires and, and you know, the smoke was a constant presence. And a lot of the um, meetings and, and things that I took through through the beginning of the year, um, it seems so far away ago now because not long after that, we were hit by a global pandemic. It's grounded flights, canceled conventions, it's locked cities down. It's forced a lot of us to change the way we do our work and, and change the way we conduct our business. And that's been a huge challenge. And the results have been, you know, both good and bad, um, ups and downs. But just as we were sort of, getting our hand hit around that and, and, and figuring out that path forward. Our industry was hit by a, a sledgehammer, All right? Which, you know, probably is a little bit uh, of an exaggeration, but, you know, we have a new AAA studio in Australia, which is super exciting. You know, it's great to see that people now have that um, opportunity to work at these studios of this scale in Australia. They've been on an aggressive hiring spree and that's sort of disrupted a bit of our industry as, as people have been shuffling around and, and you know, it's been a while since we've had a big aggressive player in town, and, and it's exciting to see how that's uh, how that's changed our interesting uh, our industry. Um, the timing of it has also been kind of interesting, given the other events that have happened through this year. It makes it a bit difficult for everyone to be able to respond to, um, to, to that sort of a that sort of a change. But these events, this sort of a year, this really does reveal what the strengths of our industry are. It, it sort of shakes away all the artifice and, and looks at what those foundations are and, and, and really challenges us to, to look at them and, and see how strong they are. Um, you know, I've talked a lot in the past about the ecosystem that needs to be in place. And in previous talks, I've sort of been focusing in around the development ecosystem, you know, making sure we have studios and, and developers working at different scales so that people have those opportunities to, to continue their career in many different ways. But an ecosystem is more than just uh, development studios. When I look at it now, I think that we need to be, take a bit of a wider view, a bit of a broader view of what an ecosystem can be in our industry. And particularly as we look at ways to, to fund our future, we need to consider that wider picture. So look, let's, let's run through the big highlights of the last little while. Um, AAA is, is back, you know, Sledgehammer have been expanding uh, in a big way. This is, uh, like I said, it's exciting. It provides that full scale of what we've been looking for from people to be able to start their career in a startup and then move through studio systems all the way up to the top and with AAA. The ability for someone to work on a, on a franchise like, like Call of Duty here in Australia, that, that's an exciting place to be. Um, you know, it, it, it means that talent that would have otherwise had to leave Australia can now find that, uh, have that career here within Australia. Um, it does mean that our four largest studios are in by overseas companies. And, and that, so that is a little bit of a, a bit of a risk. Um, I think in the past that might've caused a bit of concern or at least I might've thrown that down as a, as a, as a gauntlet for people. Um, but you know, one thing I will say is that we have a lot of uh, studios just nipping at the heels, League of Geeks uh, and have, have had a fantastic win in picking up um, a contract with Private Division, began to grow from strength to strength, play side, Look, the, the news on word on the street, the word on Kotaku is that they're looking at an IPO. That's that's a fantastic outcome and will really change the, the, the shape of our industry. And we'll redefine what is possible within, within our industry. And, and, you know, I've got myself up there at Mighty Kingdom, but Half Break F SMG, there's a lot of studios that are doing um, fantastic work and, uh, and are growing as well. So I don't think it'll be too long before we see 
more of our own homegrown studios within that top four. One thing we should also consider though is that our biggest games were almost all published by overseas publishers. The, this is not a knock against the studios who, who are doing it, but it's just a reflection of the fact that we don't have that full publishing ecosystem here available in Australia. Um, you know, the, the biggest deals that we have, the biggest publishing deals um, are all signed by, by uh, overseas companies. But at the same time, that is changing a bit as well. You know, fellow travelers have been doing some fantastic work with, with narrative, um, you know, focusing on narrative games. Uh, Blowfish quietly kicking goals over there, um, hits to our big end. There's, there's a huge number of um, studios who are or publishers who are emerging and uh, looking to fill those gaps. Now, look, we still don't have a, um, you know, a private division or a Kowloon Knights that is, a, that is Australian owned. We know we're not quite at that scale yet where we can fund those 10 or $20 million products. But, you know, the cupboard's not bare. We've got the, the you know, all the large publishers are represented here and we have a few small um, local publishers that are expanding and growing and, and taking those next steps. So it's not a, not, a, not a complete wash. You know, if we look now at an, an investment, this is a real challenging one. There are no dedicated um, VCs or, or, or investors uh, that focus particularly on the game industry here, here in Australia. You know, we don't have a, a, a play ventures or, or all the equivalent. And look, this is changing. You know, as, as I mentioned up front, we've taken on investment. That's been a, you know, an exciting journey for us. Um, and there are some investors out there that are looking at this industry that they, they're catching the wind of the of, of the change that's that's coming and they want to be part of it um and um, i mentioned a bit earlier but play side out there you know pushing the market forward looking to ipo that's going to do a lot to educate the market about what our industry is and, and and what it can be and what the successes look like uh but look when it comes to investment it comes to a sophisticated investment around the games industry that that needs a lot of development and the final part of a, of a sort of thriving ecosystem here would be government support. And here, the state government support is, is incredibly strong. Um, we've actually had a few wins over the last little while. We, here in South Australia, we've had the, the PDV extended out to encompass the games industry. And that, that's going to have a lasting impact on the development of, uh, the, ecos of, the, of the industry here in, in South Australia. And Victoria has always had a long history of supporting the games industry. Um, the other states are lifting their game. Um, the miss missing piece has always sort of been that that federal support, but you know this was this is something that happened in the last uh, little while, which was a bit of a surprise to me. But you know when a when a liberal senator from Queensland is is standing up and saying we should support this industry, that's you, you can feel a shift is coming. You can feel um, you know, that there is change. And and I think if you look at this at this tweet as well, um, there's another big piece of of news that's sort of hidden in there as well which is that we now have a, a unified industry body that's representing our industry and our needs uh, with a single voice to government. This is a, this is a big change and, and a big shift and it's, a, it's pretty exciting. Um, it's like, a, it's almost a bit like Captain Planet, right? Where uh, all their powers combined are, are, greater, are greater than the whole. Um, you know, when, when we, we think about the, the smart people that we have at the GDA and IGEA, um, you know, in the past where they felt they couldn't step on each other's toes, now they can put their um, put the best minds together and, and do some great work. I'll, I'll let you all figure out which planeteer, who is which planeteer. I think uh, I have my picks, but I, I, won't, I won't reveal them here. So let's give us, you know, let's have a look at the industry now and give us a, a, a grade. Let's give us a, a, a report card. You know, if we look at the development, you know, eight out of 10, we're doing, we're doing a wonderful things here. Um, still need to focus on building some resilience and independence, which, which I'll sort of dig into a little bit more. Um, but overall, we're starting to develop that full scale from, from top to bottom, um, which is very exciting. Publishers, you know, look, there's some great promise there. We've, we've, like I say, we have the tops and the bottoms uh, represented. It's just about filling out that middle and, and making sure we can publish games in Australia at every scale. Um, but so there's plenty of room for growing there. Investors, well, okay. Uh, significant support needed as, as I've written here. There's this is the one that's going to take the longest to, to fix, but um, I think there's some there's some ways that we can get there. And if we look at government, um, again, excellent progress made. Uh, it's still a little bit inconsistent depending on, uh, it's still very location dependent. So the different states have different um, support systems. We'd love to see some consistency there. And we'd love to see the federal um, government step up with some support as well. But, you know, if I was to give it an overall grade, I reckon this is probably about a C plus report card. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a passing grade. Um, but there's plenty of opportunity to improve and, 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 to, and to scale up. I, I think I'd give it an A for effort, um, but, you know, and 
there's plenty of opportunity here, as I say, to, to grow and expand. So what do we need to move forward? Uh, moving into the future, we need to have a complete eco ecosystem. We can't just have one that focuses on development or just on publishing or just on investment. We need the entire thing. We need all of it to come up together. Um, this is ultimately gonna be how we fund the future of our industry. So how do we do it? Um, I don't have all of the answers, but I do have some ideas. So I'm gonna run through them now and, and uh, talk about the key points that I think will help us uh, grow that future. One of the first things we should be look, thinking of doing is reducing our reliance on, on overseas capital. We have a great ecosystem of developers uh, in Australia, but it is still quite reliant on, on funding um, from overseas, whether that's work for hire, whether that's um, publishing um, um, contracts, or whether that's just you know being uh, completely wholly owned by an, by an overseas um, studio. As I mentioned on a slide earlier, 20% of our industry does work for, for external publishers or, or, or publisher backed studios. And you know, a lot of our, our, our studios are reliant on, on overseas funding. That makes us a little bit vulnerable when it comes to currency shifts, when it comes to um, sort of you know, market changes. Uh, if, I, I, I didn't want to say it again, but uh, if we think about the impact of the GSC on our industry, that, that sort of highlighted what happens when you're overly reliant on, on external funding or external capital. So we need to, to mitigate this as much as we can. Um, the best way to do that is to develop our own products, original products that we can then take to market and, and, and generate our own income. But also um, we need to look to back our own publishers and work with them to, to expand what they're able to do and what on the scale that, that they can work at, um, which is exactly what my next slide points out. We need to grow local publishers that can invest at scale. We need to make sure that we have a complete ecosystem with publishers here at every scale. So from the, from the startup, from the, from the, um, from the early funding for the small projects all the way through to that large funding. You know, I'd love to be in a position where we can have publishers in Australia that can invest $50 million in, into a game. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be crazy? Uh, you know, we have all the major publishers here are, are represented in, in somewhere or another. And we do have uh, you know, a, an emerging ecosystem of, of smaller Australian focused publishers, but there is a bit of a gulf in the middle and that's gonna take time and, and effort to, to, to fill out. You know, we're, we're sort of in a position at the moment where we're relying on those smaller publishers to, to break out and to have a success and, and jump up in a big way. And that's, it feels awfully like, you know, crossing your fingers, um, which is not a good place to be. Um, we need to be able to support these publishers as well as any new ones that want to appear as well. Um, obviously, that's a little bit difficult at the moment because, um, you know, the investment uh, community is a little bit uh, underdeveloped and, and what we really need to do is create a games investment community. And this is probably the one area that needs the most development and, and it's not one that has any sort of easy answers. You know, when sort of confronted with a challenge like this, I like to look at what other industries have done to overcome these, these hurdles. One thing that I've, um, that I, if we look across to other sort of tech industries, a lot of their, their VC startup funding and, 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 and whatnot was created by um, former founders or, or, or entrepreneurs who'd, who'd been successful coming back and giving back into that community. Um, you know, we, that sort of forms that angel network and that, and that um, creates that, uh, what's what I'm looking for? It, it, even if they're not running the funds themselves, if, if they're working with other people who do have um, VC or fund um, management backgrounds, they can provide the expertise and the guidance so that people know that they're making informed investments rather than essentially crossing their fingers, right? That's, that's where we don't want to be. Our industry had, does have a reputation of being sort of hit driven, which I think is a way of trying to paint us as being random. But, you know, if, if our industry was essentially random, you wouldn't have big players. You wouldn't have entrenched studios like your uh, um, EAs and your Activisions, you know, they, they, they simply wouldn't exist. So there is some predictability and there is some ways of, of mitigating that risk. And so it's about educating the investors to know what is a smart investment, what isn't, where the risks are, what the returns could be. Um, and that starts, like I say, from angel funding all the way up to, to, to scale up funding. At the moment, uh, we look at government grants as really taking the, the, the place of, of angel funding. Um, but again, that's not consistently applied across all states and, and the amounts available aren't necessarily enough to help studios take the step, that next step to that next level. Um, you know, we need to think about you know, th those people who have had success, we need to, to look at how we can give back to that ecosystem. You know, I, was, I was thinking the other day, what's, uh, 
what's Rob Murray doing? You know, he's uh, had a lot of success with Fire Mint and 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 with now Fire Monkeys, and that's there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of uh, intelligence, and there's a lot of uh, experience, and there's a, and there's a lot of uh, insight there that we can be gained if we can keep, help these people stay within our industry and, and rather than feel like uh, once they're done they're they're out. Um, and like I say, they don't have to lead these funds, but they can certainly help um, it, it help inform them. Now, look, I know when we talk about investment, it's going to be a bit of a dirty word uh, in, in, in the Australian games industry. It's a lot of people don't want investors. This is a question I get a lot of. Um, I've, I've heard many, many variations of this particular statement, um, you know, saying sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't trust investment or, you know, or they're just in it for the money or, you know, they're just building for an exit or they're just looking after their portfolio. And, and look, I get it. They're all, they're all valid um, points. But like it or not, this is a is a commercial industry, right? We need we need money to make our games. We need to pay the people who, who make them. But and we also need those games to make money. Um, it's almost inescapable. That's that's how we grow and we scale. Um, in a mature ecosystem where we have all parts of it working um, you know, working well, that allows anyone to plug into that ecosystem at whatever scale or whatever level that they feel comfortable with. It allows, you know, it supports not just games for commercial outcomes, but games for art outcomes or for social outcomes, a whole bunch of different things. At the moment, we don't have that scale. We don't have that complete ecosystem. So we're still in a, in a bit of a halfway house. And so people who lean out of talking to investors, people who, who, who decide to, to shun those, those advances when they come, it actually does limit the, the industry for everyone else who, who is looking for investment or is looking to scale up. Um, but not, not everyone who listens to this is going to be in a position to invest or, or wants to be an investor or take on investment. But by talking to the investment community, by talking to VCs, by talking to fund managers, it helps them understand our industry. Um, you know, the, the incentives that we're seeing from South Australia and, and other states are creating interest in our, in our industry. The, in this particular moment in time, um, our industry looks very attractive. We it can very effectively work from home. We don't have to put anything on a boat, ship it overseas. It's all sort of digitally delivered. This is an industry that is primed for growth and people are looking at it as a potential investment vehicle. But we don't want people to come rushing in and, and throw money at problems without understanding what they're throwing money at and then have all of that fall apart. And then we just scare away of the very investors that we need to, to take our next step as an industry. So I would suggest that even if you're not someone who ever wants to take investment or even just hates talking to investors, spend some time, you know, a 30 minute conversation explaining your business to, to and, and someone from the investment community could be the difference between another company succeeding or failing. They, they, you know, that, it may not be you that, that reaps that benefit, but someone within the ecosystem will. And the, a great place to start with this is to talk to your local um, uh, government department who looks after this in, in South Australia, DTI is our, you know, they're our, they're our friends. They do a lot to advocate for our industry and advocate for um, us internationally. But Austrade are another, another organization that's really great to talk to. Just let them understand, get them to understand what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, even if it's not relevant for you, the effort that you put in there will pay off space and pay off in, you know, the dividends will, be, will pay off handsomely um, down the future. So if we look, you know, the commercial, commercial help focus, I think, if we just acknowledge that and understand that about our industry, um, it will help with this, with this next part as well. We need to really scale up what our industry is doing. You know, by international standards, we don't make a lot of money in, a, in the Australian games industry. And so we need to sort of 10X, we need to multiply, we need to take an order of magnitude um, step forward for our industry. Because um, I think if we sort of look at where our uh, industry sits on, on a chart, we're not even in the top 100 of export revenue in Australia. Um, Look, if it's just off the top of the chart here, but at number 87, inedible meat flour makes more money than our industry, uh, which, you know, come on, we can, we can beat inedible meat flour. Uh, so what if we could 10X industry, you know, like if we take it from the $140 million that it's uh, earned in, in 2019 and we move up the chain to $1.4 um, billion, where does that get us? All right, this is now we're in some exciting company. If you think about the end, you know, you think you look at those industries around uh, around us at that scale, and uh, just imagine how much interest that we would get um, from the government and from investors and, and from you know, the wider community if we could rank up there, um, you know, sitting up there at, at number twenty eight on the list, just behind Sawdust. I'm sure we, we you know, just a few more million we can be, we can beat Sawdust. 
And if you're thinking about, and if you're looking at that and thinking that's an impossible dream, um, you know, Finland does that, uh, you know, they do twice as much, that, as much revenue as that. Of course, they do have Supercell, which probably does skew the numbers a bit. But if we look at the UK, you know, they're, they're pulling twice again. So 2.75 billion is their industry um, off 20,000 um, full-time equivalents or, or employees working. So if we, we earn about a similar amount per capita, if we divide the number of people working in industry by the amount of revenue it generates. So it really is just a, a function of scale. The more people we can employ, the more money they can, the industry can generate. Um, you know, this is a, a people powered industry. So and it's a talent industry for us to 10 X our earnings. It means we 10 X a number of people working in industry. And that's really, really exciting to think that we could go from having sort of 1200 FTEs in Australia at the moment to 12,000. You know, these are the sort of numbers that get people excited when we talk about the potential of our industry, but it does also um, throw up another challenge, right? We need to develop a broad and deep talent pool. We have a, uh, in my experience, at least, I feel we have a very sort of top and bottom heavy industry when it comes to developers. We have a lot of um, very experienced people in our industry. But when you, when you, when a big studio turns up and, you know, like Sledgeham has been hiring quite aggressively lately, we tend to see the same senior talent sort of moving around the industry. We see the same names come up again and again. Um, you know, conversely, at the, at the other end of the pool, uh, we have, uh, when, when we ran our graduate program last year, we had 350 applications for, for five positions. Uh, you know, that's that's a, to give you an idea of what the scale looks like at that end as well. So we need to get better at developing that talent and providing that pathway so that we can take those graduates of, of this year and, and, and grow them into being the, the mid and senior talent of tomorrow. Um, again, this is one of those things where it's just uh, an, an investment of time. It, it's going to take a commitment from those people in the industry who have the experience and, and who have been um, in here for a while those of us with the gray hairs, as, as, as I've written in my notes, um, that means, you know, spending that time mentoring uh, and passing on our knowledge and nurturing that next wave of talent. Uh, it means sort of you know, reaching out, partnering with universities, talking to universities, making sure that they, you know, all those training organizations, AIE, SAE, all the rest, that their, their courses are relevant, that they're teaching relevant skills, um, that, they're, that they're providing, you know, that they're building that um, pathway for people into industry. It also means that we should look for talent in, in, in new places and bring new voices into the mix. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about diversity and it's, it's very common knowledge now that a diverse industry will outperform a homogenous one. So we need to make sure that we're not just um, deepening the pool, but broadening the pool, allowing more people to be part of this industry, particularly if we wanted to 10X and get up to, to 12,000 12, um, employees. We can't just uh, do what we've done. We need to do something different. We need to make sure that we're looking, uh, you know, turning over every stone to make sure we're giving everyone the opportunity to, to be part of this. And I think, you know, the other, the other challenge that we have is that, um, particularly if we look to expand out in, you know, investment publishing and, and, and other, other parts of the industry, there are some specialist skill sets that, that are very difficult to find in Australia, um, particularly you know, marketing, publishing, user acquisition, monetization. These are the parts that we often outsource overseas or, or we sort of stumble our way through um, you know, there are a few people who, who are doing outstanding work in this area, but it's, it's about, um, you know, unlocking that, uh, that skill set and making that available for everyone to learn from. And, you know, there's, there's some great uh, communities that have sprung up around particular parts of, of the industry around, around free to play and, and other places. Those are a great step. And, and the more we can do that, the more we can do to share our knowledge and, and pass it on, the easier it'll be to, do, to go from 1200 people to 12,000. And, Look, I understand it can be difficult in some in some faces in in some places like VFX and other adjacent industries. They do get a lot of government support, and that can sort of make it a bit difficult to to compete for talent. Um, it does drive up the price, which is which is fun. Um, you know, wouldn't it wouldn't it be nice if we had our own uh, our own PDV? It would, but my advice would be like, let's not wait for government support. We talk a lot in our industry about the, the lack of federal support and we compare ourselves a lot to, to Canada. I know I've done it in the past, you know, um, and yes, adjacent industries do seem to get a lot easier uh, when it drives up our costs and it, it makes it competition for talent, particularly around sort of, uh, you know, artists and animators and, and a few spe special skill sets can, ma can make it really, really challenging. Um, but I think, you know, uh, to, if relying on government support to fix our problems feels awfully like a good old uh, underpants gnome, uh, um, business strategy that we're waiting for government support uh, to help us build a successful industry. And, and I think, 
you know, as tempting as it would be to, to look at, the, at, that, at that rebate and, and imagine what that world would be, um, we should really be focused on, on making great games and great companies with or without government support. And, and federal support, if and when it comes, should really be a rocket booster to an industry that is already thriving. You know, we shouldn't think of it as, as, as a life support system that, you know, that allows us to, to continue and to, and to zombie on as people talk about zombie companies lately. Um, you know, a life support mach machine can be switched off and then what, you know, whereas if it's, a, if it's a rocket booster, at least when the booster comes off, you know, now we're amongst the stars, we're, we're, we're no longer, you know, um, earthbound. And so, you know, we should also think about supporting ourselves before we even consider government support. If we, if we took five cents from every dollar that we earned as an industry and put it into a, into a fund, then we could create our own interactive games fund every year, forever. Um, we don't do that sort of stuff. We don't think that sort of way. Um, but what if, you know, what if we did? I, I have a feeling that if we took steps like that and, and put things back into our own industry, it would find that it's a lot easier to engage with government and, and get them excited about what we're doing because we can demonstrate that we're looking after ourselves and we, and we we can do it without them and that what they will add is additive and will just create more jobs, more growth, more scale, which is what they're excited about. Um, so the, you know, the last thing I have, one more thing on government support. Are we even ready? Like if, if we woke up tomorrow and there was a 40% rebate, you know, if, we, if you're an SA like us, um, what would that look like for us? Are we even in a position to be able to capitalize on, on that? Do we have the capital to be able to invest in, into, our, into ourselves, into our businesses to actually uh, really fully utilize this? I can tell you that if a 40% rebate was on the table, there would be a rush of investment into this industry. And instead of you know, one studio expanding, um, you know, it would have dozens, it would have money flying, flying into this industry in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, that will be a lot of pressure on our industry to grow, um, to capture more of the market. Uh, and I'm not really convinced that we have the framework in place right now today to, to support that. It could be overwhelming to consider that future. And the, and the natural sort of question would then be to ask is how do you, how do you compete in that, in that market? You know, the, it, can be, it can be scary to think about all this other growth and, 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 and money flying around. And it was gonna put a lot of pressure on each of us to, to consider what we wanna do and, and how we wanna position ourselves in the market. Or, or, or luckily the, the answer to this one is, is actually relatively easy. The, the way you compete in a market like that is to just be the best you, be the best company that you can be. You can't be a, a company that's everything to everyone. Um, and if you're worried about other studios overtaking you or being bigger than you or, 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 or looking at other markets that you're not looking at, the solution isn't to act like them and try and, and mimic them. The solution is to provide an alternative, is to provide you know, to, to focus in on what your vision and what your values are as a company and to focus on those parts that you can control because a, a complete ecosystem will, will support and encourage um, a wide range of businesses, not just those at the top or those at the bottom, but everything and all the way in between. So lean into your vision, um, understand what it is that you want to get out of this industry and create that space and, you know, lean on the quirks of this industry. We are, you know, we're an entertainment industry. There's a, there's a limitless capacity for people to be entertained. So we, we aren't competitors in a lot of ways. We are um, in this together. So you, there's nothing to be lost by helping others with theirs. And I think here, this is an opportunity for us to, to raise the bar, to set the standards. If we are gonna see an influx of capital and influx of studios, let's be conscious of what those standards are. Let's create an industry where new studio, studios that do appear have to meet or exceed our standard work environment. You know, we've, um, let's look at things that other people aren't looking at. Let's look at a four day work week. You know, at, at, at Mighty Kingdom, we have a, uh, we've invested a lot into building an environment that makes it a, a great place to work, um, to nurture that talent and, and to give them a, a place where they feel respected and, and, and feel um, supported and, and, and making really great and creative products. You know, let's, let's think of things like menstrual and menopause leave, uh, mental health days. Um, you know, let's focus on teaching that new generation of talent how to, how to manage that balance between work and life so you're not dominated by when all those young enthusiastic people enter the industry we don't want to burn them out and, and have them exit and, and roll somewhere else you know, let's let's set that uh, as a standard um, that's how we as a business that's how all businesses should be attracting talent that's how you retract re retain talent and as an industry that works as well if we if we can set this as the standard 
then it makes game development a very attractive industry to work in as opposed to you know the the alternative which feels like uh you know the, the reputation that we have of of crazy hours and, and and ridiculous work ethic let's let's change that let's raise that bar and let's look at ways to unlock new talent you know when i look across the applications for our grad program the talent is is, is incredible and it's incredibly diverse there's a, there's a huge amount of untapped potential there so you know we should be aiming to create an environment that unlocks that potential that rewards and supports diverse viewpoints within our industry and sets our standard as i said before about how they're treated because that will lift up the entire industry and, you know if if we collectively all stood up for diversity equality equity tolerance you know this this again sets the bar that everyone else will be will be measured by and let's invest in our collective future it's, we need to think about and act as an industry and not just as individuals and it's not about maximizing any one return for yourself but about understanding that there's a longer game and a longer play here and that a, a deeper and, and more expansive ecosystem will will actually lead to more success for your business rather than less uh, you know one, one way to think about it is um, you know how many how many companies lost sales because a title goose game was was a success right that's that's not how our industry works if anything, the increased exposure that brings actually lifts other, other companies and lifts other studios because it, it starts conversations that wouldn't have otherwise started. So we need to understand that we are part of that ecosystem that will support us you know, through our successes, but also our, fail our failures. And we need to embrace that about our industry and we need to invest in our collective future. I think the best example of that I can think of at the moment is the, the big, end, big, hug, hug, <laughs> big hug, which is why I think a lot of people here are listening to this presentation, hopefully. Um, it's a huge gesture and that's now set the bar for the rest of us to all follow right we, we need to be thinking of that way we need to think about things that lift the entire industry and and yeah they're not fun and they don't they don't often um you know that it can be difficult to try and justify that through a single company's perspective but industry-wide uh, we'll, we'll see that pay off in spades and as i said before one person's success here does not does not guarantee someone else's failure you know i've, I've spoken at, uh, at gcap before about uh, creating a billion dollar IP. I wanna create a billion dollar industry now. I, I want us to 10X our industry. I want us to commit to that and look at growth and, and look at scale as, as an outcome to bring more people into this industry. And uh, you know, again, because if one of us wins, we all win, right? If we can get a, a company up to that scale, um, that creates a, a great environment for the rest of us to operate in as well. So you know, I wanna expand on that billion dollar IP idea. I, want, I, wanna, I wanna see a billion dollar game that is developed in Australia by an Australian studio that was invested in by Australian VCs, by an Australian investment firm that's focusing on the games industry that was supported in Australia by federal and state governments to create a game that was published in Australia by an Australian publisher where the entire value is 100% owned in Australia. And what I'd love to see is for that success to be then owned, retained in Australia and reinvested back into the industry to refuel the next cycle. And that, that what's, that's what creates a thriving ecosystem. And that's how we can fund the future of ourselves is by being completely self-sufficient, having the entire industry here, not just parts of it. Um, you know, if we go back to the original question here that I asked, how do we fund the future of the games industry here in Australia? We do it by investing in people. You know, it, this is a people powered industry and that is ultimately what's gonna be our success. Um, the, our, we could all take some time to work with others, to work with other studios, work with other um, developers, work with nurturing talent, growing talent, mentoring and supporting those people who are trying something different, trying something new. That's what's gonna allow our industry to grow and that's how we're gonna, we're gonna fund the future. All right, thank you. That's my idea. Um, I'll be super excited to hear your questions and to hear what, um, what your ideas are about how we get there. And uh, I know um, later on today, Liam will be talking more specifically about the different funding options that are available. So definitely tune in for that. Okay, thank you.